The analysis of communications between Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 and in Marsat's satellite telecommunication network provide the only source of information about Flight 370's location and possible in-flight events after it disappeared from radar coverage at 2:22 Malaysia Standard Time (MYT) on the 8th of March 2014, 17:22 Coordinated Universal Time, the 7th of March, one hour after communication with air traffic control ended and the aircraft departed from its planned flight path while over the South China Sea. Flight 370 was a scheduled commercial flight with 227 passengers and 12 crew which departed Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia at 041 and was scheduled to land in Beijing, China at 6.30 China Standard Time 6.30 MYT, 22.30 Coordinated Universal Time, 7 March. Malaysia has worked in conjunction with the Australian Transport Safety Bureau to co-ordinate the analysis, which has also involved the UK's Air Accidents Investigation Branch, in Marsat, and US National Transportation Safety Board, among others. Others have also made efforts to analyse the satellite communications, albeit challenged by a lack of publicly available information for several months after the disappearance. On 29 July 2015, debris was discovered on Réunion Island which was later confirmed to come from Flight 370. It is the first physical evidence that Flight 370 ended in the Indian Ocean. During flight, the aircraft maintains a datalink with a satellite communication network for data and telephone calls. The datalink connects the aircraft and a ground station via satellite, which translates changes the signal's frequency and amplifies the signal. The ground station is connected to telecommunication networks which allows messages to be sent to and received from other locations, such as the airline's operations center. Normal communications from Flight 370 were last made at 107 MYT and the datalink between the aircraft and satellite telecommunication network was lost at some point between 107 and 203, when the aircraft did not acknowledge a message sent from the ground station. Three minutes after the aircraft left the range of radar coverage, at 225, the aircraft satellite data unit SDU transmitted a log on message which investigators believe occurred as the SDU started after a power interruption between the 225 message and 819 the SDU acknowledged two ground to aircraft telephone calls which were not answered and responded to automated hourly requests from the ground station that were made to determine whether the SDU was still active None of the communications from 225 to 819 contain explicit information about the aircraft's location. The aircraft's final transmission at 819 was a log on message. The aircraft did not respond to a message from the ground station at 915. Investigators believe the 819 log on message was made when the SDU was restarting after the aircraft ran out of fuel and the aircraft's auxiliary power unit was started. The search for Flight 370 was launched in Southeast Asia near the location of the last verbal and radar contact with air traffic control. The day after the accident, staff at Inmarsat reviewed the log of communications between their network and Flight 370 and discovered that Flight 370 continued for several hours after contact with air traffic control was lost. On the 11th of March, they provided a preliminary analysis to investigators based on recorded burst timing offset BTO values. Relatively simple calculations can be made from BTO values to determine the distance between the aircraft and satellite at each transmission. When these distances are plotted on Earth, they result in rings which are further reduced to arcs, due to the limited range of the aircraft. Another value Burst frequency offset BFO, was analyzed to determine the movement of the aircraft relative to the satellite, based on the Doppler shift of the signals, which provides the location of the aircraft along the BTO-derived arcs. Initial analysis of the BFO values showed a strong correlation with a track south into the southern Indian Ocean, west of Australia. On 24 March, Malaysia's Prime Minister cited this analysis to conclude that Flight 370 ended in the southern Indian Ocean with no survivors. After the initial analysis, the BFO calculations were later adjusted to account for a wobble in the satellite's orbit and thermal changes in the satellite which affected the recorded BFO values. 
Further analysis considered the BTO and BFO calculations with flight dynamics, such as possible and probable aircraft speeds, altitudes, and autopilot modes. Two statistical analyses were made and combined with calculations of Flight 370's maximum range to determine the most probable location of Flight 370 at the time of the 819 transmission, which is along the 819 BTO arc from approximately 38.3 degrees south 88 degrees east, minus 38.388 southwest corner of the area of interest along the 819 BTO arc. ATSB Flight Path Analysis Update October 2014 to 33.5 degrees south 95 degrees east minus 33.595 southwest corner of the area of interest along the 819 BTO arc ATSB flight path analysis update October 2014 topic <laughs> background Topic. Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 departed Kuala Lumpur International Airport at 041 Malaysia Standard Time MYT on the 8th of March 2014 1641 coordinated universal time the 7th of March bound for Beijing Capital International Airport at 1.19, Malaysian Air Traffic Control ATC initiated a hand-off to Ho Chi Minh Area ATC. The captain responded, Good night Malaysian 370, after which no further communications were made with the pilots. At 1.21, the aircraft disappeared from the radar of air traffic control after passing navigational waypoint IGARI 6 degrees 56 minutes 12 seconds north 103 degrees 35 minutes 6 seconds east in the South China Sea between Malaysia and Vietnam. The aircraft continued to be tracked by Malaysian military radar, which recorded that Flight 370 deviated from its planned flight path, turning around and crossing the Malay Peninsula. Flight 370 left the range of Malaysian military radar at 2.22 and was last located 200 nmi 370 km, 230 miles northwest of Penang. Flight 370 was expected to arrive in Beijing at 6.30 China Standard Time CST on 8 March 6.30 MYT, 22.30 Coordinated Universal Time, 7 March. At 7.24 MYT, CST, Malaysia Airlines issued a media statement that Flight 370 was missing. Topic. Satellite datalink The datalink for Malaysia Airlines avionics communications at the time of the incident was supplied by CETA, which contracted with Inmarsat to provide a satellite communication link using Inmarsat's classic aero service. Aeronautical Satellite Communication SATCOM systems are used to transmit messages from the aircraft cockpit as well as automated messages from onboard systems using the ACARS communications protocol, but may also be used to transmit fans and ATN messages and provide voice, fax, and data links using other protocols. An appropriate comparison of ACARS relationship to the SATCOM system is that of a messaging application to a smartphone. The smartphone functions and will remain registered on a mobile phone network even if the messaging application is closed. The data messages from the aircraft are transmitted by the aircraft satellite data unit (SDU) and relayed via satellite to a ground station where they are routed to other communication networks to reach their destination. Messages may also be sent to the aircraft, in reverse order. When passing through the satellite, the signals are amplified and translated in frequency, mixed with the signal from an oscillator in the satellite, leaving the satellite at the combined frequency. Transmissions from the aircraft are made on one of several channels frequencies near 1.6 GHz, combined with frequency of the satellite's oscillator, and transmitted to the JESS at the combined frequency one of several channels near 3.6 GHz. The ground station then translates the received signal before it reaches equipment to be processed. The ground station keeps a log of transmissions and some data about them. 
When the SDU tries to connect with the Inmarsat network, it will transmit a log on request, which the ground station acknowledges. This is, in part, to determine that the SDU belongs to an active service subscriber and also used to determine how to route messages to the SDU. After connecting, if a ground station hasn't received any contact from a terminal for one hour, the ground station will transmit a log on interrogation LOI message, informally referred to as a ping, an active terminal automatically responds. The entire process of interrogating the terminal is referred to as a handshake. Equipment at Inmarsat's Perth ground station had been upgraded in 2013 with additional storage capacity and new software to record an expanded data set for transmissions, including the addition of burst frequency offset BFO, and burst timing offset BTO values. Without the addition of the BFO and BTO values, it would not have been possible to determine the aircraft's distance from the satellite at each handshake and hence significantly narrow the search region. The expanded data values were prompted by Inmarsat's involvement in the search for Air France Flight 447, which disappeared over the Atlantic Ocean in 2009. The company felt the additional data values could be useful in future incidents. According to Inmarsat's Vice President of Satellite Operations, Mark Dickinson, the company did not know precisely how these additional data values might be useful but they had a hunch and decided to invest in upgrades to ground station equipment to record these values. Topic. Emergency locator transmitters The aircraft was equipped with four emergency locator transmitters ELTs. A fixed ELT on the aft fuselage which is activated by sudden deceleration. A portable ELT in a cabinet located in the front of the aircraft which must be activated by moving a switch, and two ELTs attached to slide rafts which are armed when the rafts are inflated and activated by water immersion once activated the ELTs emit a radio signal which can be detected by the satellites of the International COSPAS SARSAT program the ELTs are designed to work at or near the water's surface damage during a crash shielding by aircraft wreckage or terrain and submersion in deep water are all factors which may prevent the signal's detection in a review of accident records maintained by the ICAO over the past 30 years, there were 173 accidents involving aircraft over 5,701 kilograms (12,569 pounds) equipped with ELTs. Of these, an effective ELT detection was made in only 39 accidents. No signals from ELTs aboard Flight 370 were detected. Topic. Communications from Flight 370 The SDU on 9MMRO the aircraft used for Flight 370 logged onto the Inmarsat network at midnight MYT. In the 30 minutes prior to takeoff, 17 messages were exchanged between the SDU and the Inmarsat network. An additional three messages were exchanged between takeoff and the time Flight 370 disappeared from secondary radar. The final message to use the ACARS protocol was sent at 107. ACARS reports expected at 137 and 207 were not received. At 203 and 205, messages from the ground station went unanswered, indicating that the link was lost at some point between 107 and 203. After last contact by primary radar west of Malaysia, the following records were recorded in the log of Inmarsat's ground station at Perth, Western Australia HH, um, SS, UTC times 7 to 8 March. Topic. Analysis by the Joint Investigation Team The analysis of the satellite communication relies on a limited number of data points that were analyzed using innovative techniques that were only developed after the incident. The analysis has worked to determine useful information about in-flight events and the location of Flight 370 at the 819MYT signal. Believed to have occurred near the time of fuel exhaustion and thus as close to the final location of Flight 370.
Topic: <laughs> Joint Investigation Team. Malaysian investigators set up an international working group, the Joint Investigation Team (JIT), consisting of various agencies with experience in aircraft performance and satellite communications, to further analyze the signals between Flight 370 and the ground station, especially the signal at 819. These included representatives from the UK's Inmarsat, Air Accidents Investigation Branch, and Rolls-Royce, China's Civil Aviation Administration and Aircraft Accident Investigation Department, the US National Transportation Safety Board and Federal Aviation Administration, and Malaysian authorities, after initial analysis determined that Flight 370's last location was within Australia's search and rescue region in the southern Indian Ocean, Australia has played a major role in co-ordinating the analysis in conjunction with Malaysia. The Australian Transport Safety Bureau ATSB is responsible for the search for Flight 370 and has brought together a team of experts to determine the location of Flight 370 at the 819 communication. The team brought together by the ATSB includes the UK's Air Accidents Investigation Branch, Boeing, the Defence Science and Technology Organisation Australia, Malaysia's Department of Civil Aviation, in Marsat, the National Transportation Safety Board US, and Thales. Topic. Concepts The analysis of communications from Flight 370 focuses on two key parameters associated with the messages Burst Timing Offset BTO, the time difference between when a signal is sent from the ground station and when the response is received. This measure is twice the distance from the ground station to satellite to the aircraft and includes the time that the SDU takes between receiving and responding to the message and time between reception and processing at the ground station the latter two times are constant and can be calculated and removed. This measure can be analyzed to determine the distance between the satellite and the aircraft and results in a ring on the Earth's surface that is equidistant from the satellite at the calculated distance. Burst frequency offset BFO, the difference between the expected and received frequency of transmissions. The difference is caused by Doppler shift as the signals traveled from the aircraft to the satellite to the ground station, the frequency translations made in the satellite and at the ground station, a small, constant error bias in the SDU that results from drift and aging, and compensation applied by the SDU to counter the Doppler shift on the uplink. This measure can be analyzed to determine where along the BTO rings the aircraft was located. Topic. Deductions A few deductions can also be made from the satellite communications. The first deduction that can be made from the satellite communications is that the aircraft remained operational until at least 8.19. Seven hours after final contact was made with air traffic control over the South China Sea. The varying BFO values indicate the aircraft was moving at speed. The aircraft's SDU needs location and track information to keep its antenna pointed towards the satellite, so it can also be deduced that the aircraft's navigation system was operational. Since the aircraft did not respond to a ping at 9.15, it can be concluded that at some point between 8.19 and 9.15, the aircraft lost the ability to communicate with the ground station. Malaysia's Department of Civil Aviation noted this time was consistent with the maximum endurance of the aircraft, and this time is believed to have been the result of the aircraft entering the ocean after fuel starvation. The ATSB is confident the seventh handshake represents the area where the aircraft ran out of fuel before entering the ocean. The log on message sent from the aircraft at 8 hours 19 minutes and 29 seconds was not immediately well understood. The 225 handshake was also initiated by the aircraft. Only a few reasons that the SDU would transmit a log on message exist, such as a power interruption, software failure, loss of critical systems providing input to the SDU, or a loss of the link due to aircraft attitude. Investigators consider the most likely reason to be that they were sent during power-up after an electrical outage. 
At 8.19, the aircraft had been airborne for 7 h 38 minutes, the typical Kuala Lumpur-Beijing flight is 5 half hour and fuel exhaustion was likely. In the event of fuel exhaustion and engine flame out, the aircraft's ram air turbine would deploy, providing power to various instruments and flight controls, including the SDU. Approximately 90 seconds after the 225 handshake, communications from the aircraft's in-flight entertainment system were recorded in the ground station log. Similar messages would be expected following the 819 handshake, but none were received, supporting the fuel starvation scenario. Topic burst timing offset for system efficacy and reliability aircraft transmissions made in response to a signal from a satellite are sent in timed slots referenced to the time the signal from the satellite arrived using the slotted aloha protocol the time that the signal is sent from the ground station begins the time slot the burst timing offset bto is the time difference between the start of the time slot and the start of the transmission received from the aircraft it equals twice the distance for the ground station signal then aircraft's response from the ground station to the satellite to the aircraft plus the time the aircraft's sdu takes between receiving the signal and responding the sdu bias and the delay between the time the signal arrives at the ground station and the time it is processed when the bto value is logged the ground station bias. The satellite's location is known, thus the distance from the satellite to the ground station can be calculated, while the combined bias of the SDU and ground station is relatively constant and can be calculated from signals exchanged earlier in the flight while it was on the ground at KLIA, thus leaving the distance between the aircraft and satellite as the only variable. The combined SDU and ground station bias was calculated from 17 signals exchanged between the ground station and the aircraft during a 30-minute period before takeoff, when the aircraft's location was known at Kuala Lumpur International Airport. To establish the accuracy of their calculations, the bias value was used to calculate the distance from the aircraft to the satellite during the time it was on the ground at KLIA, with errors of, relating the BFO value to the elevation angle between the aircraft and satellite, was based on methods developed during the Flight 447 investigation. The first and seventh handshakes gave anomalous results and were excluded from the initial analysis, but the issue was later resolved. The initial analysis, accurate to approximately 1 degree, determined that elevation angle between the aircraft and satellite at the 811 handshake was 40 degrees. When this was publicly disclosed by Malaysian officials, the arc was broken into two arcs, dubbed the Northern Corridor and Southern Corridor. The first and seventh handshakes were later determined to be part of a log-on sequence, as opposed to the other handshakes that were log-on interrogation messages. The bias value during the logon sequence is different and was calculated using historical data for the aircraft's SDU. This allowed the distance between the satellite and aircraft to be determined at these times. Topic: <laughs> Burst frequency offset. While the BTO is able to determine the distance between the satellite and the aircraft at the time of each handshake, it was still necessary to determine where along the BTO arcs the aircraft was. To accomplish this, an analysis was performed on another attribute of received signals that was recorded by the ground station, the burst frequency offset, BFO. The difference between the expected and actual frequencies of the signal received from the aircraft. The BFO is primarily caused by the Doppler shift, a shift in frequency caused by the relative movement of the aircraft, satellite, and ground station, along with several other factors which can be calculated and removed, allowing the Doppler shift between the aircraft and satellite to be isolated. The Doppler shift between the aircraft and satellite indicates the relative motion of the aircraft relative to the satellite, although multiple combinations of aircraft speed and heading exist that match a given Doppler shift value. 
When the aircraft's SDU responds to messages sent from the ground station, it uses the aircraft's navigation system to determine the aircraft's position, track, and ground speed and adjusts the transmit frequency to compensate for the Doppler shift on the uplink signal. Based on the satellite being located in its nominal position in geostationary orbit 35,786 kilometers above the equator at 64.5 degrees east. The initial analysis was calculated with the satellite at its nominal location in geostationary orbit, 35,786 kilometers (22,236 miles) above the equator at 64.5 degrees east longitude. However, the Inmarsat 3F1 satellite was launched in 1996 with an expected lifespan of 13 years and to extend its lifespan by conserving remaining fuel, it was allowed to drift from its nominal location into a slightly inclined orbit. A map of the sub-satellite points—the location on Earth's surface directly beneath the satellite shows that the satellite moves counterclockwise in an oval shape between 1.6 degrees south to 1.6 degrees north and 64.45 to 64.58 degrees east. As a result, the adjustments made by the SDU only partially compensate for the Doppler shift on the uplink. This error is immaterial to the performance of the satellite network, but was crucial to eliminate the northern corridor during the initial analysis, as the signal passes through the satellite, it is translated by, added to, a signal generated by an oscillator in the satellite. Although the oscillator is housed in a temperature-controlled enclosure, it is subjected to thermal variation throughout the day that results in minor changes in the frequency of the translation signal. The thermal variation results from the rotation of the satellite relative to the Sun over a given 24-hour period, including the time the satellite passes through the Earth's shadow which affected the 340 and 426 handshakes, and is complicated by the use of heaters that run when the oscillator temperature exits pre-determined limits. The variation in the translation frequency was calculated over several days, including the day of Flight 370's disappearance, and could be factored into the BFO measurement. Additional factors that affect the BFO are a translation made at the ground station between the reception and processing of the signal which is monitored and can be factored in and a fixed bias in the aircraft and satellite oscillators due to drift and aging which can be calibrated by measures recorded when the aircraft's location and speed were known. At 2.40 and 6.14, ground-to-aircraft phone calls were made that were unanswered by the cockpit but acknowledged by the SDU. The signals associated with these calls could not be analyzed to generate a BTO value, but BFO values of these signals can be considered in the analysis with the other BTO and BFO data. The technique used to analyze the BFO values was validated against 87 aircraft with the same SATCOM equipment operating in the region around the time of Flight 370's disappearance and against nine previous flights operated by the same aircraft 9MMRO. The sensitivity to error was calculated during the early phase of Flight 370 when the aircraft's location, track, and ground speed were known. This resulted in an uncertainty of plus or minus 28 degrees heading and plus or minus 9 degrees of latitude. Topic. Combined analysis with flight dynamics The BTO analysis was able to determine the distance between the satellite and aircraft with a relatively high degree of accuracy, while the BFO analysis was able to estimate the heading and speed of the aircraft, but is sensitive to small changes in input data. To determine the final location of Flight 370, the BTO and BFO analyses were considered in combination with aircraft performance limitations, such as altitude, airspeed, and wind. The BFO analysis was able to isolate the Doppler shift between the aircraft and determine the relative motion of the aircraft to the satellite, which is reduced by the limited range of speeds at which the aircraft can fly and thus a limited set of speed-direction combinations exist that correlate with the calculated Doppler shifts. The aircraft has three autopilot modes. The standard mode for en-route navigation is LNAV, which navigates along a great circle route between waypoints, adjusting the aircraft's heading to compensate for wind. Other modes will maintain the aircraft's heading. 
direction the nose is pointed flight path will be affected by winds or the aircraft's track direction the aircraft travels flight path in a straight direction the latter two modes are further affected by whether the aircraft used magnetic normal reference or true north typically only used at high latitudes as the reference for the autopilot. Since Flight 370 flew near waypoints Vampy, Mikar, Nilam, and possibly IGOGU, all along Air Route N-571, while traversing the Malacca Strait, investigators considered whether Flight 370 followed any air routes or intersected any waypoints in the southern Indian Ocean. Waypoints MUTMI and RUNUT were considered possible points that Flight 370 may have traversed, but tracks through these waypoints did not correlate well with paths generated from the BTO and BFO analysis. Two analysis techniques were used to combine the BTO and BFO results with flight parameters. Data error optimization – Candidate paths varied speed and heading at each handshake to minimize the error between the calculated BFO of that path versus the actual BFO recorded from Flight 370. These paths were not constrained by the behavior of the aircraft's autopilot. Constrained autopilot dynamics – The aircraft is assumed to be flying under the control of one of the autopilot modes. Candidate paths were generated using each mode. BTO and BFO values of each path were calculated and compared against the recorded values from Flight 370. The top 100 constrained autopilot dynamics candidate paths were selected on the basis of their match with the satellite data from Flight 370 and their consistency with autopilot behavior. The distribution of these paths at the intersection with the sixth handshake was then generated, with some paths outside south of the maximum range of the aircraft and which can therefore be eliminated. The candidate paths generated by the data error optimization method were weighed according to the root mean square of the BFO values at each handshake. The distribution of results from these two methods were charted together, indicating that the total probability areas overlap on the 811 arc between approximately 35 to 39 degrees south. These paths have then been extrapolated to the seventh handshake at 819 and constrained by the maximum range, intersecting the seventh arc between approximately 33.5 to 38.3 degrees south. This is the most likely location of Flight 370 at the time of the seventh handshake. Topic. Determining the final location of Flight 370 and search area Knowing the location at the seventh handshake, investigators then needed to determine an appropriate width of the search area from the seventh arc. The seventh handshake was a log on request initiated by the aircraft and is believed to be the result of the SDU starting after power failure, resulting from fuel exhaustion and following the deployment of the ram air turbine and restart of the auxiliary power unit. The log on request would have occurred 3 minutes and 40 seconds after fuel exhaustion, commonly known as flameout in aviation, of the second engine, flameout of both engines would not have occurred simultaneously, at which point the autopilot would have disengaged. The BFO value of this handshake indicates the aircraft may have been descending and the aircraft was traveling northeast to southwest. The ATSB has determined that an unresponsive crew hypoxia event appeared to best fit the available evidence. For the period of flight that Flight 370 tracked south over the Indian Ocean, an analysis of aircraft systems, particularly the electrical system and autopilot, are ongoing. Boeing and Malaysia Airlines have conducted numerous end-of-flight scenarios in their Boeing 777 simulators. The scenarios involve flameout in one engine before the other without any input from the cockpit. This scenario results in the aircraft entering a spiraling low bank turn with the aircraft entering the water a relatively short distance from the last engine flameout. If control inputs were made i.e. the plane was under the control of a pilot and depending on the initial altitude, it is possible that the aircraft could glide over 100 nautical miles 190 kilometers, 120 miles. However, investigators believe Flight 370 was most likely uncontrolled at this point. 
The ATSB cites a previous study conducted for the B, which determined that in cases of an upset followed by loss of control all impact points were within 20 nmi 37 km, 23 miles of the start of the emergency, and in most cases within 10 nmi 19 km, 12 miles. Based on this, the ATSB chose a 50 nmi 93 km, 58 miles width, 20 nmi 37 km, 23 miles to the west and 30 nmi 56 km, 35 miles to the east of the arc for the underwater search in June 2014. While keeping the 50 nmi width for the priority search area, the ATSB determined that the aircraft most likely entered the ocean close to the seventh arc and the underwater search would be conducted from the seventh arc and progress outwards. Topic. Other analyses In the weeks after Flight 370's disappearance, discussions concerning the analysis of satellite data began on the website of space scientist Duncan Steele. The informal group of people, most with scientific backgrounds, soon became known as the Independent Group IG, and has worked to analyze possible flight paths to determine the most likely final location of Flight 370. For the first few months, their efforts were hindered by a lack of data publicly released and they were critical of the official analysis by Inmarsat. The IG also pressured officials to release data related to Flight 370's satellite communications. The IG did not believe there was sufficient evidence, using publicly available information, to exclude the possibility of Flight 370 following a northern track prior to the release of the communication logs on 27 May. Some of the IG members have worked on analyzing specific elements of Flight 370's flight path, such as the mid-flight speed of Flight 370 and precise location of the Inmarsat 3F1 satellite. On the 17th of June, before the 26th of June release of a report by the Australian Transport Safety Bureau (ATSB) detailing the analysis of the satellite communications, the IG released a statement that they believed the final location of Flight 370 is 36.0. 02 degrees south 88.57 degrees east minus 36.02 88.57 final location determined by independent group june 2014 at the time of the sixth handshake which was used because the seventh handshake was not well understood at the time their most recent evaluation, published in July 2015, of the final location of Flight 370 is 37.105 degrees south 89.871 degrees east, minus 37.105, 89.871 Final location determined by independent group, Flight Path Model V15.1 July 2015. Another analysis was made by Simon Hardy, a Boeing 777 captain, and published in March 2015. Hardy's analysis is a mathematical model to determine the track of Flight 370 from the fourth to sixth handshakes, assuming that the aircraft's track and speed would be constant during this period of the flight. He calculated that the aircraft was likely flying on a 188 degrees magnetic track, which the aircraft would compensate for winds to continue in a straight line, and that the final location of Flight 370 is near 38.082 degrees south 87.400 degrees east, minus 38.082, 87.400 Final location determined by Simon Hardy, June 2014. Topic. Timeline On 8 March, Inmarsat provided basic flight data relating to Flight 370 to CETA, which relayed information to Malaysia Airlines and investigators. On 9–10 March, Inmarsat engineers noted that the ground station log recorded pings from the aircraft for several hours after contact was lost with air traffic control. Malaysian investigators set up an international working group, consisting of various agencies with experience in aircraft performance and satellite communications, to further analyze the signals between Flight 370 and the ground station, especially the signal at 819. 
These included representatives from the UK's Inmarsat, AAIB, and Rolls-Royce, China's Civil Aviation Administration and Aircraft Accident Investigation Department, the USNTSB and FAA, and Malaysian authorities. An analysis of the time difference between the transmission of the ping and the aircraft's response allowed Inmarsat to determine the aircraft's distance from the satellite. This resulted in two arcs, referred to as the Northern Corridor and Southern Corridor, where the aircraft may have been located at the time of its last complete handshake at 8.11. Using an innovative technique that has never before been used in an investigation of this sort. The team determined it could also use the burst frequency offset to determine the aircraft's speed and position along the identified arcs. In Marsat Cross checked its methodology to known flight data from six Boeing 777 aircraft flying in various directions on the same day, and found a good match. Applying the technique to the handshake signals from Flight 370 gave results that correlated strongly with the expected and actual measurements of a southern trajectory over the Indian Ocean, but poorly with a northern trajectory. Further revised calculations to account for movements of the satellite relative to the Earth allowed the Northern Corridor to be ruled out completely. This analysis was passed in to Malaysian authorities on 23 March. At 2200 local time the next day, 24 March, Prime Minister Najib cited this development concluding at a press conference that Flight 370 ended in the southern Indian Ocean. Using a type of analysis never before used in an investigation of this sort. In Marsat and the AAIB have concluded that Flight 370 flew along the Southern Corridor, and that its last position was in the middle of the Indian Ocean, west of Perth. This is a remote location, far from any possible landing sites. It is therefore with deep sadness and regret that I must inform you that, according to this new data, Flight 370 ended in the southern Indian Ocean. In an article published on 8 May several satellite experts questioned the analysis of satellite pings made by Inmarsat staff because the Doppler frequency shifts measured were apparently not properly corrected against the satellite's own drift a periodic north-south oscillation of 3 degrees every 24 hours. Without any additional data being released, the implication of this new analysis was that the northern portion of the Inmarsat satellite pings arc could not be ruled out. The Malaysian government released the satellite data three weeks later. Details of the methodology used to analyse the satellite communications were provided in the Australian Transport Safety Bureau's report MH370 Definition of Underwater Search Areas, published in June, and a supplement released in October, a peer reviewed paper by Inmarsat scientists published in the Journal of Navigation in October 2014 provides an account of the analysis applied to the satellite communications from. Flight 370. Their analysis concluded that Flight 370 was near 34.7 degrees south 93.0 degrees east, minus 34.7,93.0 location at last contact provided by Inmarsat scientists in the Journal of Navigation paper, October 2014 when the final transmission from the aircraft was made, but in their conclusion they stress that the sensitivity of the reconstructed flight path to frequency errors is such that there remains significant uncertainty in the final location. Their analysis used a simplified model of the aircraft's flight dynamics to illustrate how the measurements may be transformed into a reasonable flight path and note that other investigators used more sophisticated models to determine the underwater search area. Although access to the journal requires a subscription, its publishers felt this paper and subject are too important, and that it should be shared with the world. And the paper was released as an open access article with a Creative Commons attribution license. Since the October reports, analysis of the satellite data has continued to be refined. In March 2015, ATSB Chief Commissioner Mark Dolan remarked that he is slightly more optimistic than six months ago, because we have more confidence in the data." On 29 July 2015, a flaperon from Flight 370 was discovered on Reunion Island. The ATSB reviewed their drift calculations for debris from the aircraft and, according to the JACC, they are 
satisfied that the discovery of the flaperon at La Réunion is consistent with the current underwater search area in the southern Indian Ocean. Reverse drift modeling of the debris, to determine its origin after 16 months, also supports the current underwater search area, although reverse drift modeling is very imprecise over long periods of time. <laughs> Notes <laughs>